Give to the poor, widow, fatherless. Romans fifteen twenty five and 26 But now go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints who are in Jerusalem. The brethren of Macedonia and Achaia made a contribution for the poor saints in Jerusalem. They sent it through Paul. We have already talked about the deep poverty of the Macedonian church, but see how their heart was. They were willing to give to people that were poorer than them. The Macedonian church was poor, but they did not have a poverty mindset. As long as a person sees himself as poor, he will never give to anybody and always be on the receiving end. Even if you are poor physically, you need to see yourself as a rich person who is facing a time of famine in the land, and you need to sow your way out of that time of famine. This is the promise of the Lord for those who do so. Proverbs 19 verse 17 He who has pity upon the poor lends unto the Lord, and that which he has given will he pay him again. Proverbs 28 verse 27 He who gives unto the poor shall not lack, but he who hides his eyes shall have many a curse. Proverbs 21 verse 13 Whoever stops his ear at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Psalm 41 1 to 3 Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and you will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing or illness. You will restore him on his sickness. Whenever we give to the poor, widows, fatherless, or anybody that is destitute, let us have in mind that we are doing that to Jesus, not to man, and Jesus will bless us with the blessings listed above. For Jesus himself said, Matthew 25, verse 32 to 36, and before him, Jesus, shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Matthew 25, verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. The early church understood the giving to the poor. They helped the brethren in Judea who were facing a severe famine. Acts eleven twenty nine to 30 Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren who dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Chapter 5 O Forgiving People's Debts Voluntarily, Not Compulsorily When we come into Christendom, we meet all kinds of Christians, unfortunately. Some are not faithful when it comes to the area of finance. A lot of godly friendships are destroyed because one brother or sister borrowed money and does not want to pay that money back. In the church of Corinth, some brethren were acting that way. They would borrow money, but they would not pay back. Even after they have been reported to the eldership of the church, they would not give the money back. And in some cases it is even the pastor, or the apostles, or the bishop, who does not want to give back the money that he or she borrowed. What do you do in that case? To whom do you report the apostle, the pastor, or the bishop? 
When I was growing up, my parents trusted a man of God. They even donated an SUV to that man of God. And during the war in my country, my parents gave that man of God tens of thousands of pounds to keep for them until things were better. But when things became better, the man of God did not want to give the money back for years, and finally we went to see the bishop, but the bishop was not willing to confront his assistant. So we decided to sue that man of God, who was the bishop's assistant. Because the bishop did not want the name of the church to be in the newspapers, he arranged for us to withdraw the lawsuit, and the church paid back my parents' money in many installments. It was not that man of God who paid it, but the church. My parents still attend that church, but they know that some people are not faithful when it comes to money. In my own case, a church owed me some money. The leader called me and asked me to give him the receipts to give to the finance department of that church so they could refund my money. After many months, nothing was done, so I asked the people in the finance department and they said they'd never heard of that case and had never received any receipt. I went back to the leader and asked him again, and he told me to bring a new receipt, but I'd already given him the originals. Thank God I had the copies, so I brought the copies to him. After some months, I asked the people in the finance department again, and they said they had never heard of the case and had never received any receipts. Deep inside of me, I was frustrated and very angry. I told one of the people in the finance department, if the church wanted me to donate those things, they should have come clean, and I would have made up my mind whether I wanted to donate them or not. But they said they wanted me to buy them on their behalf, and they would give me the money back. I let go of that money because it was pointless as after more than two years they had not even refunded me a penny of that money. I released them of that debt. Brethren, do not be fooled. Even some men of God are not men of their words when it comes to money. Still in the church, when some people ask me to lend them some money, my answer is no straight away. But I tell them the amount I'm willing to give them for free and they can go to someone else and borrow the rest of the money. I simply do not want money to come and destroy that brotherly love between us. I know some churches or church members, they would tell me, do this work for us and we will pay you this amount of money. Buy this equipment for us and we will give you your money when you come back. And when I have done the work or bought the equipment, they ask me to buy for them, they say nothing about the money any more. They are hoping that I will forget to ask for my money. And when I ask, they say, We do not have it right now, but next month and next month they still do not give it to me. They should have asked me straight away, Can you do this for us free? Or can you donate these things because we do not have the money now? and I would have made up my mind whether I wanted to work for free or to donate those things. I've learned my lessons over the years with some Christians. I love them, yet I do not trust a single word that proceeds out of their mouth when it comes to money. When they now ask me to go somewhere for them, I need to see, first of all, the money. I do not advance my money because I know they will not give it back to me if I do that. When they ask me to buy equipment and they give me the money, I tell them, when you give me the money, I will buy it. And for one year they have not given me the money, so I say to myself, if I bought that equipment, I would never have seen the color of my money back. I would lie to you if I did not tell you that these things exist in the church and happen between brethren. There is nothing new under the sun, Solomon said, Ecclesiastes 1.9. In the Old Testament, God told the Jews to lend to each other without interest. If you lend money to any of my people that is poor by you, you shall not be to him as a usurer, neither shall you lay upon him usury. Exodus 22 verse 25. 
Christians must abide by the same word of God when it comes to lending brethren money. But Israel was facing a problem. When they lent the money, some people were not willing to pay back. They would make all kinds of excuses, so the people had to bring the case to the priest who would judge if the person was truly not able to pay or was just a dishonest person. If he was not truly able to pay, the priest would tell the lender to wait until the years of release or the year of jubilee, and if until that year the person could not pay, he had to release him from his debts and restore his properties. But if the person was able to pay, but was just a dishonest person, that person was committing a trespass, so he had to pay 20% interest on the money that was lent to him, Leviticus 6, 1-5. But those dishonest Jews, after they had been found guilty, would not even pay the initial money lent to them, not to talk of the 20% interest. They found another way for not paying. They would wait for the seventh year, which is the year of the release of the Lord, or Shemitah, Deuteronomy 15 and Deuteronomy 31. On that seventh year, Jews were commanded by God to forgive the debts of the people who owed them, and they should not harvest their fields, so that foreigners, poor, needy, widows and orphans could reap their fields. But God gave them a promise that if they observed that year of release, he would bless their business and give them on the sixth year the income of two years. So basically they were not losing anything, for on the sixth year God would give them the increase of the sixth year and of the seventh years, so they had doubled their profits in the sixth year. But it takes faith to obey that year of release. Just like in the wilderness for forty years, on the sixth day God gave them manna for two days. Exodus 16 verse 5 God told them also, after they have observed seven Sabbath years, or seven years of release, which is forty-nine years, on the fiftieth year they must observe the year of Jubilee, or the acceptable year of the Lord. Leviticus 25 On that year of Jubilee, or the acceptable year of the Lord, not only shall they forgive people their debts, but they shall also restore their properties, and set all their slaves free. Nobody wanted to do that. The people asked, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. God answered, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. Leviticus 25, 20-21 In other words, on the forty-eighth year, God gave them a profit or increase of three years, the 48th, the 49th, and the 50th. Dishonest people used the year of release and the year of jubilee for not paying their debts. So when they were coming close to those years, they would slow down their payments, Deuteronomy 15. So the Jews did not want to lend money to anybody any more, or they were now lending money with interest, even high interest. They were tired of being abused by people who were using the word of God to justify their financial dishonesty. And today we have many people who use the word of God to justify their financial dishonesty. They will tell you, just forgive me, the Bible tells you to forgive. No, the truth is they are thieves. The same thing that was happening with the Jews is now also happening in the Church of Christ. Some brethren borrow money and do not like to pay it back. Some brethren employ believers and do not give them the proper wage, or even do not pay them at all, and they say, it was for the Lord that you were doing that. No, I was working for you, and you were supposed to pay me. God has nothing to do with it. They are just dishonest people, thieves, using the word of God to justify their bad conduct. James says to such brethren, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. 
your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of the harvest. You have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts, as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. James 5, 1-6 but to the believers who've been victimized, James says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. You, be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. James 5, verse 7 to 10. God is not blind. He has seen what those dishonest brethren are doing, and he will move on your behalf. So Paul now tells the church at Corinth, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 1 I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded or cheated? No, you do wrong and defraud or cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. 1 Corinthians 6, 5-8 Thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 10 So Paul is telling us, When you've been defrauded or cheated, do not go first to the unbeliever in the court of law, but to the church, to the elders of the church. Now there are two parties the one who's been defrauded and the one who is defrauding. When you are the one who is defrauding, Paul tells you to accept that you are wrong and do what is right by restoring the money. Do not try to justify yourself. To the one who's been wronged, Paul says, you must put your eyes on God. If the person gives a genuine reason why he cannot restore that money at a certain point, you will have to let go of that money, because your brother is so poor that he cannot pay it back to you. Why is Paul telling us that? He is using the Levitical law of the year of release and the year of jubilee which I have explained earlier. If that brother or sister is dishonest and still refuses to give the money, Paul advises you to accept being wrong and release that brother or sister. The agape love or unconditional love is doing to others what we want people to do to us. Matthew 7 verse 12 You must put your eyes on Jesus who is your jubilee, your acceptable year of the Lord. Luke 4 verse 19 in the Old Testament, when people could not pay off their debts, they were sold as slaves, even their entire family, and in the year of Jubilee they were freed from their slavery, and their properties and inheritance was restored to them. Jesus is our Jubilee. He came to set all the slaves free, and to expunge our debts. He wants us to release people who genuinely cannot pay off their debts, and even some dishonest brethren. 
He tells us, if it is possible, as much as it depends on us, we should accept being wronged and believe that Jesus, who is our jubilee, will restore many times what we have forgiven people. Having said that, do not accept even for a second unsaved people defrauding you financially. Fight them back, get your money back, because it is of the devil. But for brethren in the church, use what Jesus tells us. Jesus told us in Matthew eighteen twenty three to 35 what the kingdom of God is like. The king who is God wanted to take account of his servants, you and me. So one came who owed God a thousand talents of gold, which is about 27,700 kgs of gold, since one talent weighs about 27.7 kgs. The servant could not pay, so the king asked that he should be sold to slavery himself and his family, but as he pleaded for the mercy of the king, the king had mercy on him and forgave him all his debts. But this servant, as soon as he walked out of the presence of God the king, he met one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, or a hundred pence. Now one shekel weighs about six grams, and the weight of nine pence is equal to that of one shekel. So a hundred pence is about 66.67 grams, or 0 0.06667 kgs. It is almost 415,479 times lesser than what God the King has forgiven him. But that servant could not forgive his fellow servant, who told him to have mercy on him. The same words he himself used to the King, and the King forgave him his debts. So you see, Jesus is your jubilee, and he will restore to you many times, even 415,479 times, what you have forgiven people. It is better than the jubilee the Jew had, for God only gave them three times their increase in the year of jubilee. But Jesus, our jubilee, tells us, God our King has greater things in store for us when we learn to forgive people's debts and put our trust in God. Nobody should force you to forgive people's debts. It must come from your heart. No pastor, no apostle, no prophet, no evangelist, no teacher should. They can only present the truth to you and you make up your own mind. Philemon had a slave called Onesimus. That slave defrauded him and fled to Rome. Now, according to the law, Onesimus was Philemon's property, and if a slave runs away from his master, when he is captured, he is put to death. But while Onesimus was in Rome, he was converted by listening to Paul, who at that time was in prison in Rome. So Paul, knowing the scriptures, sent Onesimus back to his master Philemon. Philemon had the freedom to prosecute Onesimus to the full extent of the law, to get back what his slave stole from him and put him to death for running away, or he could decide to forgive Onesimus and set him free. We have already explained that in the year of Jubilee, Jews were to free all their slaves. So since Jesus is now our Jubilee, no Christian is supposed to have a slave, including modern slavery. Those who have slaves must now have them as hired servants, no longer as slaves. Leviticus 25, 38-40 That is why Paul tells us, when we are Christians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, verse 28 so Paul says to Philemon, You know all the teaching of the gospel, and you know that I am an apostle, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting according to the scriptures. Yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. For Onesimus, Philemon 1, 8-10 Paul said to Philemon, Without your consent I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. Philemon 1 verse 14 
Paul said to Philemon, If you are not willing to forgive Onesimus his debt and free him from slavery, when I come, I will pay you the money he owes you and also the money to free him as a slave, which was thirty shekels of silver in those days. Exodus 21.32 Our Lord Jesus was sold to death by Judas for the price of a slave, thirty pieces of silver. Matthew 27 verse 3 so that all the slaves, when they are in Christ, might be made free. Brethren, it is our right to prosecute people who owe us money to the full extent of the law, but for love's sake and voluntarily we decide not to, and we put our trust in Jesus, our jubilee. Now when unbelievers steal our money, we go after them to the full extent of the law, to get our money back unless God specifically tells us not to. Brethren, there is no virtue if you do not have a choice with many options. That is why Peter tells us, You have been given exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you, that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 4-8 Therefore all things, whatsoever you would that men should do to you, you do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7, verse 12 I have noticed that God is always asking me to accept to be wronged by dishonest brethren. In the beginning I would say to God, Why me? Why do you not talk to them and tell them that what they are doing is not right? But with time I have learned that God is even 415,479 times more in store for me than what they had stolen from me. The more they steal from me, the more God blesses me. I'm always a winner, and those who are defrauding me will never be able to impoverish me. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Jubilee, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 I used to stand on the scripture which says, Men, do not despise a thief, if he steals to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Proverbs six thirty to 31 Now fold is the same quantity added. So, for instance, twofold is twice as much as the same quantity. Fourfold is four times the same quantity as much, and sevenfold is seven times the same quantity as much. When I discovered that God wanted to give me almost 415,479 times as much the quantity that these brethren stole from me, it put a smile on my face and a hallelujah song in my mouth. Jesus tells us, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. You, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10 verse 16 Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Matthew 7 verse 15 now, I must give you the full counsel of the scriptures, for not everybody who is in church is a true born-again Christian, and not every born-again Christian is obedient to the word of God. Jesus tells us, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, for instance borrowed money from you and he does not want to pay back, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he shall hear you and pay back your money, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, one or two leaders of the church or mature Christians who know the written word of God, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. 
And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican. Matthew eighteen fifteen to 17 You will meet people like that in church, who even if they are confronted by the church, they will refuse to change. Love them, but consider them as heathen or tax collectors who are only after people's money, and you can decide to sue that brother to get back your money, but if he decides to pay, then withdraw your complaint. Jesus says, Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are in the way with him, that the opponent not deliver you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you shall by no means come out from there until you have paid the last farthing, quadrantes. Matthew 5, 25-26 Going to a court of law should be the last option, after we have tried everything according to the scriptures, to reason with that brother or sister who deliberately refuses to pay what he or she owes. Jesus says again, why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? For as you go with your adversary to the judge, give pains in the way to be set free from him, lest he drag you to the judge. And the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer cast you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there until you have paid the very last penny, Lepton. Luke 12 57.59 Chapter 5p Give to Ministers of the Gospel When it comes to giving to the ministers of the gospel, it must come from the heart of the believers. The minister should not be asking believers to give to him unless God says to him that he has already spoken to that believer like he did with the widow who fed Elijah. It is scriptural to give to ministers of the gospel. Jesus Christ himself, when he ministered the gospel on earth, received support for his ministry. The Bible says, And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who ministered unto him of their substance. Luke 8, verse 2 to 3. We must allow the minister of God to be able to receive our gift or to refuse it. We already talked in length about Paul who would rather die than take anything from the Corinthian church. The minister is free to say yes or no. We have also talked in length of the giving of the Macedonian church to Paul and how he gladly received their gifts, Philippians 4, 10-19. Paul says, Let him who is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things, Galatians 6, verse 6. Mary and her company of women understood it, so did the Macedonian church. Paul tells the church, It is even the Lord who has so ordained that those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 14 When the Macedonians and the Achaeans were taught the gospel, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in material things. Romans 15 verse 27 The giving to ministers of the gospel must be done willingly and let no minister force you to bless him or her financially. It must come from the heart of believers not because the minister is asking them to give him something. Now that we know a lot about what God says about our prosperity, let us act on the word of God. Jesus tells us, if we hear his sayings and do them, we are likened to wise people. Through wisdom, the house is built. By understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, its chambers shall be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, 3-4 
We have received the knowledge of the financial principles of our God. May the chambers of our house be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. In Jesus' name. Brethren, my prayer and my wish above all things are that you prosper and be in health, just as your soul prospers. 3 John 1 2 and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Galatians 6 verse 9 I, Jerry, have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it is good for me rather to die than that anyone nullify my glorying. For though I preach the gospel, no glory is to me. For necessity is laid on me, yea, woe is to me, if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I am entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. 1 Corinthians nine fifteen to 18 Brothers and sisters, pray for me. Remain blessed. Regards, G.